Is interconnectivity the ultimate truth, not separation? I spoke to Merlin Sheldrake, an expert in fungi, where we discussed many aspects of fungal life, don't be disgusting, who explained to me beautifully how the technology contained in this biological miracle could be used to change the planet. I'm asking you, are the solutions we're looking for to be found beneath our feet in the mycelium network? Is it possible that interconnectivity is the ultimate truth rather than separation? Yeah, I mean, there are lots of ways that we can partner with fungi to help us adapt to life on a damaged planet. Of course, fungi underpins the whole biosphere and have done for over a billion years. So um, it's more a question of, it's not like fungi will be necessarily doing hugely new things it's more that we'll be coming more mycologically literate and and using our mycological literacy to um to create new technologies that can lead us out of some of our ecocidal tendencies perhaps so there are there are a few ways to think about it there's uh, fungal foods and um, people have eaten mushrooms for a nobly long time but um Besides mushrooms, there are lots of exciting uh, possibilities for developing like protein-rich meat substitutes from mycelium, which can be grown very fast, uh, don't need to cut down the Amazon to grow cattle, etc. Um, there are fungal building materials that can replace plastics in many applications. And so not only can you harness sort of waste, agricultural waste, uh, which you use to grow the, the fungi, um, but you can help to disrupt these polluting industries. Then there's uh, fungal medicines, and this has obviously been a thing for a while. Penicillin is a very famous example of a fungal medicine that's, that's had a big impact. Um, psilocybin, as you say, is another. Um, but there are uh, many other possibilities here. Uh, and, um, and Paul Stamets, for example, has had a, a lot of success in treating colony collapse disorder in honeybees with fungal antiviral compounds, and that would obviously be a huge a uh, huge boon if we could harness that. Um, and then there are the possibilities of agriculture and forestry. The, the industrial agriculture is enormously damaging um, and has developed without taking account of the life of the soil. And same with a lot of forestry. Forget that like, for the, most of the forest is underground. Um, and that if we don't think about these sub-visible hidden uh, realms, then... Um, we're going to get into more trouble than, than we've got ourselves into. So um, the role for including fungi in, in agriculture and, and forestry, uh, more sustainable techniques, is, is huge. Uh, there are many others, but, but perhaps I'll stop there. What does it indicate, do you think, uh, about our world view that, um, that such utility remains unaddressed? Do you think that's just to you know like a to do with i don't know progress the sort of slow progress of science and our ability to understand and translate potential use of a, a life form such as this or is it an indication of a kind of ignorance particularly when coupled with the kind of i don't know historical and almost mythic significance of mushrooms and the way that that motif uh recurs sort of through folklore do you, does it suggest to you that there is some sort of deeper relationship between our species and the many species of fungus that you're talking about yeah well there's a very deep relationship um between any living organism and and fungi because you know fungi have played key roles in the evolution of plants for example plants are a fungi that have evolved to farm algae and algae that have evolved to farm fungi. So anything that we think of as life on land, uh, there's a fungal backstory there. Um, so we are inseparable from a history of fungi. And, um, but there, I think there are reasons for that, this neglect. And some people describe mycology as a neglected mega science. Uh, and um, fungi have received a fraction of the attention that animals and plants have over the years. And part of that was because they were seen to be a sort of plant until the 60s when they won their independence, taxonomically speaking, along with bacteria. And, um, and so that meant that you couldn't have departments of fungal sciences. You know, there was departments of animal sciences, departments of plant sciences, but there was no special place to study fungi. They weren't the same professors, the same number of students, the same amount of funding, a kind of institutional neglect. Um, and, and thankfully, they're starting to change. Um, but then there are other reasons that go back beyond that. You know, fungi live most of their lives as mycelial networks, um, branching, fusing networks of tubes, and out of sight. And the mushrooms are just the fruiting bodies of fungi. So for much of fungal life is not readily available to us. Um, and 
And imagine how little you'd know of, of an apple tree if all you saw of it were the apples that it pushed up through the ground for two weeks every year. And there'd be a lot that we just simply didn't know. Um, so I think part of it is to do it to their hidden um, lifestyles and how much they uh, are enmeshed with their surroundings. Um, and so in general, though, I think there's, there's a big change that happened in 20th century biology to do with uh, our understanding of symbiosis and the importance that symbiosis has played in the evolution of life, rather than thinking about evolution as a story of unmitigated conflict and competition, that actually uh, there's a huge role for cooperation and that the, um, the intricate and intimate interplay between different organisms has shaped much of what we see around us today. Uh, and, and so I think perhaps um, the fungal, the turn to, towards fungi and the, the rising interest in fungi is something to do with uh, the times we find ourselves in and this more ecological turn uh, as people start to realise that we're bound up within a shimmering networks of interrelation. And, and fungi are kind of poster organisms for that. You know, they, they embody their basic principle of ecology, their, their actual connections between organisms, you know, they, they, their actual living um, ecological connective tissue. Can you give us some, that's really beautiful. Can you give me some examples of that uh, intricate, intimate interplay between mushrooms? I can see your love of music in the way that you communicate. Um, can you give us some examples of, the, of that, please? Yeah, so... Um, so all plants, for example, depend on fungi that live in their leaves and in their stems um, and, and in the trunks of trees uh, and in their roots. And, and the root fungi have, have got perhaps more attention than the leaf fungi. They're, they're known as mycorrhizal fungi. And it was only with the help of these fungi that plants' ancestors could move out of the water and onto the land about 500 million years ago. Uh, and until plants could evolve their own roots, which took tens of millions of years after they'd started moving onto the land, these fungi behaved as the root systems of plants. And so there's this uh, trading relationship between plants and their root fungi. And the root fungi are, are, are nimble and uh, able to explore the soil and scavenge uh, ingeniously for um, nutrients. And the plant is able, the foundational superpower of plants is, is, is their ability to photosynthesize, to eat uh, light and carbon dioxide and, and create energy containing compounds like sugars. Um, and they can trade those sugars with the nutrients that the fungi have acquired from the soil. And there's, these, these relationships are, are very dynamic and intricately managed. You know, there's the a fungal network can be connected to multiple plants and a plant can be connected to multiple fungi. Uh, and the amount of trade that takes place between these organisms changes depending on what's going on around them, depending on uh, who else is involved, what season it is, how available nutrients are. Uh, and so this is a really, um, it's very busy. It's very busy. <laughs> When I listen to you, I get the sense that the way that we see reality is determined, I suppose, obviously, by the limitations of our sensory instruments. And were we afforded a different bandwidth, we would see less separateness and more harmony and symbiosis and interconnectivity. And that might have sort of profound philosophical implications. Like when you said, like, you know, there's these sort of submerged and uh, sub-visible realms, that was, I felt that that had a, a correlative in the sort of way that we regard reality, whether it's our own unconscious and, and also stuff you've said about our attitude towards waste being one of concealment rather than, I don't know, of process. And also our ideas around separateness and interconnectivity it's like our models of reality are suffering because of our ignorance in this area so as well as the sort of practical application that you've sort of discussed and that, you know that while it sounds very complex i'm beginning to understand the sort of how these um, systems might be utilized for the the benefit of the planet do you think there's some sort of uh, analogous reality that's sort of being alluded to almost by this um, behaviour and uh, sort of being of these of these organisms. You mean analogous to the ways that we are developing as humans in our own minds and, and psyche? Yes, and like I kind of, yes, I do sort of mean that, um, Merlin. But also, what I reckon, what I mean is that 
we um, have models of reality that are based on separateness and individualism and these models are somewhat founded upon our inability to acknowledge sort of a various strata of you know um, demonstrable reality that you're sort of describing to us and perhaps our models might alter if we had more vivid access to these realities. I think that's right. And, and it's also important to point out that many of these uh, ecological realizations that are coming out of the modern sciences have rather a lot in common with uh, many traditional worldviews that have seen the living world as um, made up of intimate reciprocal uh, relationships and um, from which humans are uh, inextricable and in which we belong. And so there's actually... Um, rather a lot of it feels remembering going on um, rather than discovery and uh, I think this is quite an important piece because many of these traditional knowledge systems um, arose, I mean most of them arose before these technological innovations that have allowed us to um, enter these fungal worlds uh, in a modern in a modern way and not, nonetheless came to uh, rather similar conclusions uh, about, uh, about, how, about how nature worked tell us about this waste thing that you write about Merlin you know like our attitudes to waste and stuff yeah well we got kind of a dis well, it's pretty seriously dysfunctional a philosophy of waste and it'd be great if we had um if we could revise this perhaps taking inspiration from organisms who have been handling um waste in a world-changing way for a very long time fungi one of the things that fungi do they're great decomposers and so um, we walk around in the space that fungi leave behind. And if fungal uh, decomposition didn't happen, then the, we'd be buried kilometers deep in the bodies of animals and plants. Um, not that those plants would have ever existed without the fungi that had held them the crow, but you can uh, forgive that oversight. In the, in, in, um, so I think this is really a powerful thought, you know, that the, the space that we exist in uh, is left over from the activity uh, of, of decomposing microbes and, and fungi. And so... Uh, given that this has been going on for a very long time, given that fungi are um, masterful decomposers, are there ways that we can harness the power to decompose to um, to re-examine our to re-examine our systems of waste, which are unconsuming, which are normally based on rather a straight line where something is made, um, it is transported to a consumer, it is used, and it is disposed of as if that is the end of its mm. life. But if we could think of this more of a circle, um, which is how a nutrient cycle in um, in the world around us, then we could perhaps um, get rid of. The, I mean, landfills are kind of the terminus. For, you know, you can think it's just like this dead end where everything just accumulates, piles up in a filthy, poisonous pile, um, a, a massive uh, a heap of of waste, which speaks to our inability to think in terms of cycles. And so, I think fungi can uh, help us to think in terms of um, of you know. Where, where do these waste streams flow to? You know, can, can we help these waste streams to flow rather than to pool in these, uh, into these horrible, um, stagnant masses? Separateness feels linear and uh, interconnectivity it could be circuitous or circular, um, it occurred to me. If you're enjoying this conversation, and why wouldn't you be? Join me over at Luminary for the rest of our discussion and for all the latest episodes of Under the Skin. Go to luminarypodcast.com to start your free trial. See you there.